You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 5 of our Civil War podcast. I am Rich, and right there is Tracy. Hello y'all, welcome to the podcast. We want to take a second here at the top of the show and say thank you to everyone who liked us on Facebook this past week. There were quite a few of you who took the time to do that, so thank you. Yes, please know it's appreciated. We hope you're enjoying what we're doing with the various historical... Civil War-related quotes there on the show's Facebook page. All right, so previously on the podcast, we talked about the Tariff of Abominations and the Nullification Crisis of 1832 and 33, which brought South Carolina and the administration of President Andrew Jackson to the brink of war. And then we closed the show by flying low and fast through the idea of Manifest Destiny, and we quickly covered the run-up to war with Mexico in 1846. Right. Well, remember that according to the notion of manifest destiny, people believed it was the United States' destiny, or its fate, or even its duty, to settle the land from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, from sea to shining sea. But a major roadblock to seeing that dream become a reality was the fact that much of that territory belonged to Mexico. We said in the last show that after Texas won its independence from Mexico in 1836, the Texans set up a new independent republic, but what they really desired was to become a part of the United States. But Mexico renounced its peace treaty with Texas, pointing out that the treaty was signed under duress while Mexican President Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna was a prisoner of the Texans. And even as Mexico stubbornly refused to back down over its claim to its rebellious province, in Washington, D.C., there was strong political opposition to the annexation of Texas, mostly stemming from the fact that Texas would enter the Union as a slave state. This opposition was not overcome until the election of 1844, when James K. Polk of Tennessee ran for president on an expansionist platform calling for the annexation of Texas. When Polk defeated Henry Clay, the lame duck president, John Tyler, saw it as a mandate for annexation, and so as his last major act in office, Tyler shepherded legislation through Congress that would add Texas to the Union. This happened in March 1845, just days before Polk became president. Mexico, understandably not appreciating this move by the United States, withdrew its ambassador from Washington in protest. But in July of 1845, a special convention in Texas accepted Congress's offer to join the United States, and this decision was then overwhelmingly approved by the voters of Texas that fall. And so, on December 29, 1845, Texas was formally admitted to the Union. While these events were taking place, Mexico threatened to invade Texas, stating that it had every right to reconquer a rebellious province. To deter a Mexican attack, the governments of both Texas and the U.S. agreed that U.S. troops would be stationed on Texan soil just as soon as the offer to join the Union was accepted. And so, by August 1845, a detachment of U.S. Army soldiers under the command of Brevet Brigadier General Zachary Taylor left New Orleans by ship and arrived at Corpus Christi, where they set up camp. With the force in the camp at Corpus Christi were two young lieutenants named James Longstreet and Ulysses S. Grant. In the face of these developments, Mexico swallowed its national pride, and in the fall of 1845, Mexican leaders agreed to receive an American diplomat for the purpose of negotiating a peaceful solution to the two countries' differences. 
But by the time the American envoy appointed by President Polk arrived in Mexico, he found that the Mexican government was in turmoil. During this time, the moderate Mexican government under President Jose Herrera was overthrown by a militant faction under Manuel Paredes, and after Paredes took over, he refused to receive the American envoy. By the way, the American envoy appointed by President Polk was a fellow named John Slidell, and he'll figure prominently in another episode down the road in our story, The Trent Affair, in late 1861. That's right. Excellent foreshadowing. Thank you. So, with Slidell having having been uh, rebuffed by the new unfriendly Mexican government, President Polk, who in his dark little expansionist heart was not at all unhappy at the continued escalation of tensions, in January 1846, Polk ordered Zachary Taylor to advance his troops into the so-called Nueces Strip and take up a position on the north bank of the Rio Grande. Now, Polk knew this move was pretty much guaranteed to antagonize Mexico, since this strip of land was disputed territory. You see, the northern boundary of the old Mexican province of Tejas had been the Rio Nueces, but when Texas gained its independence, the victorious Texans decided it would be a good idea to move the border 160 miles south to the banks of the Rio Grande thereby enlarging the territory of their new republic. And so, you ended up with this strip of territory that was claimed by both Texas and Mexico. His dark little expansionist heart? That's right. I said it. Okay. Well, we apologize to any descendants of James K. Polk who may be listening. So in March 1846, General Taylor and his force left Corpus Christi and headed south. After arriving on the Rio Grande, Taylor positioned his men on the north bank of the river, across from the city of Matamoros. The area's outraged Mexican military commander demanded that the American force withdraw, but Taylor cited his orders from Washington and told the Mexican general that the U.S. soldiers intended to stay. To the Mexican government, the advance of the U.S. military force into the disputed territory was quite obviously a belligerent act, and they assumed a state of war now existed between the two countries. But Taylor responded that his force's presence was not intended as a hostile action, and that if an actual shooting war started, the responsibility would lie with whoever fired the first shot, something Taylor said the Americans did not intend to do. And so each side settled down for a period of tense, watchful waiting. Besides building a supply depot at Point Isabel, Taylor set his soldiers to work building an earthwork fortification across from Matamoros. Throughout the first weeks of April 1846, tension mounted along the river. The Mexican government reinforced its force at Matamoros until there were over 6,000 Mexican soldiers encamped across the Rio Grande from the American earthworks, now called Fort Texas. At this time, Taylor had about 3,000 men with him opposite Matamoros. On April 14th, Taylor received an ultimatum, threatening war unless the Americans started a withdrawal to the to the Nueces River within 24 hours. Taylor responded politely, but said he wished it understood that he and his force would remain on the Rio Grande. The next day, April 15th, Taylor considered the two nations at war by force of Mexico's ultimatum. On April 23rd, General Mariano Arista, the new commander of the Mexican troops at Matamoros, sent a force of 1,600 cavalry across the Rio Grande. Two days later, at a spot about 25 miles northwest of present-day Brownsville, Texas, the Mexicans ambushed a patrol of 63 American dragoons, commanded by Captain Seth Thornton. The Americans lost 11 men, killed and six wounded, and all the rest were taken prisoner. General Taylor immediately dispatched news of the incident to Washington, D.C., saying, Hostilities may now be considered as commenced. So, back in Washington, D.C., besides pressing the Mexicans over the issue of Texas, Polk also had his eye on other Mexican territories. Soon after coming into office, Polk became aware of rumors that the British apparently had designs on the Mexican province of Upper California. When Polk received this unwelcome news, 
the United States was having difficulty coming to an agreement with Britain over Oregon. In fact, there was talk of war between the two countries. So the president was in no mood to lose California to the British, and then also have to deal with that further complication to the situation. So in late 1845, Polk sent a messenger to California with secret instructions that Captain John C. Fremont, who was leading a U.S. military expedition in the West, was to encourage American settlers in California to agitate against the far-off Mexican government. Meanwhile, Polk's January 13, 1846 order had sent Zachary Taylor and his army south into the disputed Nueces Strip. After that, tension steadily rose along the border. The Mexican government refused to see his envoy, John Slidell, and so even before Polk received word of the ambush of Thornton's dragoons, he had met with his cabinet and was preparing to send a war message to Congress, since the president thought ample cause for war with Mexico already existed. But Polk wasn't confident Congress would go along with such a declaration since a shooting war had not actually started. But then, on Saturday, May 9th, the president received Zachary Taylor's report that hostilities had commenced. The Washington Union newspaper carried a headline that evening that read, American blood has been shed on American soil! Exclamation point. On Monday, May 11th, the House of Representatives listened while a clerk read Polk's message, and then they voted 173 to 14 for war. The Senate took a bit longer, but a day later, they also supported the declaration of war by a vote of 40 to 2. And so, with Congress's stamp of approval, Polk had his war with Mexico. And then the president very soon was able to peacefully resolve the issue of Oregon. In his book, So Far From God, John Eisenhower said, Polk's determination to manipulate a war with Mexico appears to have had the effect of making Britain more cooperative. By June 12th, a month after the declaration, Britain and the United States had agreed on a compromise line for the division of Oregon. The boundary between the United States and Canada would run along the 49th parallel, ceding to Britain all of Vancouver Island. Polk could congratulate himself. The specter of simultaneous wars with Mexico and Britain had been averted. Now he could turn his attentions with minimal distraction to the war in the South. End quote. Hey, y'all, spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley. Not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth better yet what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely that's what i like to call redacted history i believe that all history no matter how good or bad needs to be told there are wars massacres battles and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books have you ever heard of mary bowser i didn't think so My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. While events in Washington were proceeding, the shooting war down in Texas was also heating up. Once hostilities commenced, the outnumbered Taylor was anxious to secure his vulnerable supply depot, 
So he left the 7th Infantry at Fort Texas and took the rest of his force, along with 300 wagons, downstream to Point Isabel. Left to support the fort, with his battery of light artillery, was Lieutenant Braxton Bragg. Once Taylor left with the main body of American troops, the Mexicans began shelling Fort Texas. They kept up the bombardment for six days, but only two Americans were killed by the fire, although one of them was the 7th Infantry's commanding officer, Major Jacob Brown. Taylor arrived at Point Isabel on May 2nd and started to load his wagons with supplies and also set to work strengthening the depot's defenses. On May 7th, Taylor and the main body of American troops set out from Point Isabel, marching back to the relief of Fort Texas. The next day, Taylor found that the Mexican General Arista had brought his army north across the river and placed it between Taylor and Fort Texas. The Mexican force was drawn up in double line, blocking the road near the pond of Palo Alto, about eight miles north of the Rio Grande. The two sides sparred like boxers, trading blows, but no punch was decisive. By late afternoon, though, many of the Mexican soldiers were distressed by the casualties they were taking from the highly effective American artillery fire. They began to grumble, and Arista eventually gave in to his army's complaining and withdrew his army a short distance away from the Americans. Arista's next defensive position was at a place called Reseca de la Palma. On May 9th, Taylor launched an attack on the second Mexican position. The thick chaparral, that is, the tough, woody shrubs of this desert area, greatly hindered maneuvering, but the Americans were eventually able to cut the Mexicans' line of retreat to Matamoros. At this, the Mexican soldiers lost heart and fled the battlefield in panic. Both Lieutenants Longstreet and Grant had been involved in the fighting, and another young lieutenant by the name of George Gordon Meade had crisscrossed the battlefield, acting as a messenger for General Taylor. The victorious Americans arrived back at Fort Texas and were upset to learn that Major Brown had been hit by a shell and died on May 5th. But still, the Americans were elated at their victory. Over the two days of fighting on the road back to Fort Texas, Taylor had lost 34 killed and 113 wounded. While Mexican losses can only be guessed at, they probably suffered over a 1,000 casualties, and perhaps twice that number deserted the beaten army. After Arista had withdrawn his defeated force about 100 miles south to Monterey, on May 18, 1846, the Americans crossed the river and occupied Matamoros. Then, during the summer of 1846, there was a lull in the action. Some hastily assembled American volunteer formations, most only signing up for three- or six-month stints, quickly arrived in Texas. But, other than dying of sickness in astonishing numbers, the poorly disciplined volunteers were of no real use before it was time for them to be sent back home. But also during that summer, a more substantial force was mustered into being and shipped out for the lower Rio Grande Valley. This force was composed of thousands of volunteers authorized by Congress for 12 months of service. And while that volunteer force is being raised, that's an excellent point to start to wrap up this episode. So we're obviously going to take more than one show to cover the war with Mexico. We had originally planned on just breezing through the war in one episode, but then it's such an interesting event in American history and such an important event on the road to the Civil War. And then, of course, there are the Army officers who serve in Mexico and who will figure prominently into our story later on. So taking all of that into account, we didn't think y'all would mind if we take a couple or three episodes to cover the war with Mexico. So that's what we're doing. Right. And next time, after we wrap up the action in 1846, we'll follow along as the war takes a dramatic turn in March 1847 when Major General Winfield Scott's force lands at Veracruz and then sets out on an epic march for Mexico City. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. Our recommendation for this episode is a book we referenced a bit earlier in the episode, So Far From God, The U.S. War with Mexico, 1846 to 1848, by John S.D. Eisenhower. Now, this book has been out for a while, since the late 1980s, and other useful accounts have come out on the subject since then, but I think Eisenhower's book is still a good 
jumping off point for someone who is interested in learning more about the war. Let me just read from the inside back flap of the book. Full of gripping graphic battle scenes and incorporating a wealth of primary source material, this is the most readable and successful account of a war that permanently changed U.S. relations with Latin America. As John Eisenhower writes, the narrow Rio Grande, which divides Mexico and the United States, has become, in a cultural sense, the widest river in the world. This is the story of how that river widened, metaphorically, to divide not just two countries, but two different worlds. Indeed, there was truth in the proverb, Poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. As always, you can find all of our book recommendations on the show's website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. And while you're there, if you scroll down the right side, right-hand side, sidebar, you can find a link to the show's Twitter account, which you just may want to check out. Yeah, because besides show updates, we're also using the Twitter account to post day-by-day tweets of what happened in the Civil War 150 years ago. For example, this past week was the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Fredericksburg in December 1862, so our tweets all this past week had to do with that battle. It's pretty cool stuff, so check it out. Just a reminder that the music you hear at the beginning and end of the podcast is the song Midnight on the Water and is used by permission of Spiritwood Music. And that's it for this week's show. Thank you for listening to The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. it's time for this episode's book recommendation. Our recommendation for this episode is a book we referenced a bit earlier in episode. So in fa- the episode. What? <laughs> <laughs> you said in episode. In the episode. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> that means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. Our- <laughs> oh, oh, man. That means it's time. <laughs> no. Okay. Whoa. Okay, let's try again. And that's it for the week's show. Thank you for listening to the Civil War Pot. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, we were so, so close. close. So close. But so far from God. <laughs> <laughs>